Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us online and in person here. What are the topics you'd like me to cover today? Pardon? Freedom from thought. Freedom from thought? Yeah. Oh. Being love. Being love. Consciousness revolution. Holy Hold harmony. On. Hold on one sec. What was the last one? Holy harmony. Yeah, after that? Sovereignty of God. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Okay, good. We're good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, There's a good variety, as always, of topics which we will weave together um, in a way that only the Holy Spirit knows how to do. So we give thanks... Um, it's kind of funny, you know, even the, the opening prayer, I finished the opening prayer and then I walked away. And I think, you know, and I hear a couple of murmurs like, oh, wow, or whatever it was, and sacred reading. It's kind of funny. Like, sometimes people actually think they would just like to go to a Sunday service and just have a normal, casual <laughs> Sunday service, you know, like, and as soon as we do this first song, which today's song was Woodstock. You know, and people are like feeling something. And then the opening prayer, it's, you know, it's never like just a gratuitous or simple Sunday service. And if you folks online were here, if you could see the audience, you would see one of the reasons. Um, uniquely weird, no. <laughs> uniquely um, deep people that just, they're just like, our, our mantra about the center, you know, students and masters on the spiritual path, this isn't a typical thing that we do. You know, this is very profound. There are people here from various backgrounds, but they don't push it and they don't sit snobbishly in it. They just, we all just kind of do this, open mind. You can, you know, some of these people are, are masters in their own right, and they sit here with an open mind and they know they're But the mastery, the brilliance, there are musicians here. There are people here who are, are pros in things that would blow your mind if you knew about it. And, and people that have been musicians for lifetimes. There are people who have been in recovery for decades um, and, and working the work and doing the spiritual work and people into Buddhism and Hinduism and all these backgrounds. And it's just, to me, it's profound. I just love it. I just think it's, it's so cool. This isn't like one thought system. Even if it was a great thought, it's not one Great thought system. It's everything. Right? You guys feel that? Yeah, it's like, wow. And I mean, we had a couple of people um, say, you know, I mean, very rarely, but once in a while we get people that, you know, uh, don't get it, you know. And we had some, one or two, I think, in the last couple of months that have said, you know, I, I won't watch these programs anymore if, if ever you speak negatively about science, religion, and government. So one thing I want to do today is take some time to talk negatively about, <laughs> let me help you get off the fence. <laughs> if you're on the fence with us, just leap. Let me help you. Um, <laughs> and, and even though I speak irreverently about institutions like that, please understand that the way I really am, there are people in science, government, religion that are sincere. Those I love. I don't care what religion it is. You know, if I saw some Southern Baptist or Catholic and, and they were praying and they said, would you pray with me? Absolutely. I would l sit, kneel, let them lead the prayer. I absolutely would. I remember a, a, an accident where a dog was hit by a, a car and it was suffering, you know. And this couple was there and I just thought, you know, let me, let me help. But... You know, it was evident that the dog wasn't going to live. 
But this couple, they said, would you pray with us? And I got on my knees with them next to the dog and put our hands together because that's what they did. And I just followed their lead in their prayer. I have no problem with that. There are sincere people everywhere of every walk of life, even sincere God-loving people that are thinking that they're agnostic. There are atheists claiming, you know, proclaiming to being atheists, and I know that they're actually believers, but they're that afraid or confused. Because when you see what people have done to God, I'd be an atheist too if I didn't know better. Because if I had to choose between human beings' version of solutions, right, uh, and Whatever else, I mean, yeah, man, I'd, I'd go with whatever else. Um, God of any kind, you know, because th this world, their approach is just so messed up. So if I have to even go without God, I can understand it. And we all need to understand each other, right? We have to understand. We can't go, I don't get it. Why aren't you in my religion? Maybe because they don't like the way you do your religion. Show them something else. Bridge with them. You know, the, the humanitarian, the humane Christ within, not the preachy one. So, you know, so I, I know you guys understand when I, when I seem a little irreverent. It's, 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 and and don't, don't think for a minute, I hate any of these institutions. I don't even acknowledge their existence. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a rude way. I love the people in it that are real. That's all. Folks that try to pull people into hurt, folks that try to scare you, they're just a joke. The only reason they do what they do is because they're so messed up. The louder they get, the pushier they get, the more messed up they are. It's, you know, do you, can you just feel that do they really know what they're saying? The reason they get louder and argue with each other on shows and all that, because they don't know. Underneath, because everything's love or a cry for love. So underneath all that, well, I disagree with you. I'm not, and these people, you just sit back. Just like you, 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 you just smoked a joint. Sit back. <laughs> sit back with a smile that says, I get it. They're all nuts. <laughs> Try it. Sit back and get it. Don't go, yeah, that's right. Just sit back. Oh, oh my God. I'm asking you, God, help me to see all of this through your eyes. And the first thing God's going to help you do is see that they're all nuts. <laughs> the louder, the more angry they become. Let it become a little funny. I know it's not always going to look and feel funny. I get that. But the more we get it, the more it's like, oh, you don't know. That's why you're so upset. Oh, brother, you're, you're afraid. You, you can start to feel underneath. The animal that bites is an animal that's scared. So you start to see through all these ridiculous games. You know, uh, uh, government has long ago ruled God out of life. And some people will say, well, government shouldn't be a part of that. I disagree. King David disagreed. God disagreed. God said, I want you to understand you are my children, and even though you're on earth, even the, the Hindu Vedas, the Vedas are saying, even though you're on earth, there's a way to have a happy dream. So here's how you can live nutritionally, you know, vitally, passionately, and it gives you this whole system of how to live fully while on earth. Um, somebody here had already asked some of the specifics. You know, freedom from thought. Conscious revolution. The, these words you're asking are about integration. How to become, right? So the Vedas are like, look, you're on earth. We are speaking to you out of love, the gods that were guiding people from, in that particular culture. Here's how you might live more fully. Even though you're in a fallen world, you can still turn it into a happy dream. And a happy dream is halfway home. Nice, okay. And it tells us how to do that. In the West, it became a little more stringent. It wasn't be, it was do and don't do. The commandments. Because it was a harder kind of people at the time. But whenever it is, or Jesus saying, you know, the Beatitudes, and, you know, be gentle, be loving, be kind, forgive. All these messengers are saying something, which is, you're in a world that's challenging. 
here are suggestions on how to handle those challenges. And that includes how to be governmental, how to be parents, everything. There should be no category that's segmented away from the beingness of God. No topic. Whether it's how to discipline your children, how to deal with financial bills, sex, all topics should be allowed to bring the presence of God so that you can raise the ability or, or knowing of how to participate in that thing. So we're supposed to have been able to bring. There's no separation of church and say it should be God in church, God in state, God in day-to-day -day life, God in parenting, God in sex, God in movie making, everything. And we've forgotten that. But, but government so easily allowed everybody to forget that. And that's their problem. I'm not going to get into opinions about government because they're not important enough to me. People are what is important to me. Not institutions made up of crazy people that try to keep people screwed up. I'm looking for how to wake people up and let's live that. I, these other names of these things, I don't care. So, <clears throat> so government, like, leave God out. It's, it, we even have voting to make ourselves agree to leave God out. Well, who voted them into office? And then we go along with it. So we just go, well, we're not supposed to say uh, uh, God's name anymore. And we're not supposed to feature the Ten Commandments in that building anymore. Who, who decided that? So our laziness, you could say, is that we're not speaking up and choosing the right politicians. But no, man. We are creating this subconsciously. Our own willingness to release God from life is enabling this whole behavior. Good, done. Science. Science wants to tell you there is no God. You silly, gullible human beings. You're just, you came from a creepy little amoeba and you somehow maneuvered yourself onto a plant or onto a, a, a earth, you know, onto shore. And then you sprouted a couple limbs, eventually developed your ability to think. And that's what makes this world. You in your brilliance, if you just study enough, you'll know how to make some contribution to science. Thinkers. Again, uh, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Right? Because I can think, it proves that I exist. Jesus said, Descartes should have said, I think, therefore I'm not. Because you that thinks you're thinking is the one that isn't here. That's all screwed up one. It's your made believe. The being, I am, therefore I am. Not I think. See, that's the independent thinker. The excessive philosopher that will talk God but never find God. The religion that will try to worship God but never experience God. Science that wants to prove there's no God. But why? Why is it so important to you, scientists, that, to prove there's no God? You know why? Because you're afraid of God. You're like, I got to prove that there's no God. Why so desperate? Because you've been hurt. And you want to know the only reason you could have gotten hurt past life or this life is because there's no God. You have to prove why you got hurt. You have to prove why there's suffering. Because there is no God. It's up to us to make it. See? So we, we mess with all this. And in religion, of course, God is encouraged. But, but watch. Because science is, and, and, and government are aggressively against God without saying it overtly. Religion is wonderful because they're passive-aggressive. What religion will do, what religion will do is tell you, no, no, there's a God, but A, it's either a mean one and you don't want to meet him, or B, it's too far removed. All you can do is follow our dogmas and history. We study the Bible to understand God. How is reading it over and over, practicing it dogmatically but not experiencing it, how does that bring you closer? And if you get closer to God and you go to church, and you say to your ministers, and I'm telling you this, I've heard this hundreds of times in my years, how many people, they go to their pastor, their church, the, the pope or whomever, and they say, I'm, I'm more involved with our church now. Oh, beloved, that's wonderful. Good job. Yes, you know why? I saw Jesus. Oh, that was the devil fooling you. you we think you're psychotic. Or, they label you as messed up when you see the God that they're telling you to believe in. But one in a million of you will not be shamed. You'll be sainted. But the sainted ones have to suffer scrutiny of the church. You know what I would say if the church said to me, any church said to me, we want to make you a saint? No. 
No, let me turn you off right now. Tell me your, the words you don't like, and I'll say those words. Anything to make you not saint me, because then I have to live in the box you put me in. Oh, anyway, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, get off the fence. You, see, this is why I, I, and nobody wants to have a partnership with me. <clears throat> a relationship. Because if ever you're on the fence, let me help you. You know, I mean, I'm like, we're in or we're... No, I'm, I'm not... The, anyway. So science, science is going to say all that has to happen is you develop a greater intellect and you learn to analyze things. Whether you're analyzing the history in the Gospels or any sacred book, even the wonderful, whether it's Taoist, Hindu, or whatever, the analysis of the letters, the black ink on paper, isn't God. So in science, the attempt to analyze things, what they do is, there's no God that can tell me what this is. I have to figure it out. With what? My cognitive left-thinking brain. So I'm going to figure out what the problem is, and then I'm going to solve it. But by analyzing it. Solve it doesn't mean really solving it. It means coming up with answers that make you go, Whoosh. now I feel better because I thought up something. So it's interesting because as soon as I'm a, a thinker, analyzing a thing, there's two things, which means separation. The shamanic way of life has always been you join with something to understand it. You don't do a lover. You join with a lover, and then magical things can happen. You don't analyze a plant. I understand their attempt to be logical about it. We will tell you the constituent parts of a plant. We'll tell you the, the chemical breakdown. Therefore, we can tell you what that does to the biology and so on. I understand their attempt to be logical. <clears throat> but then they make medicines that have side effects that they don't understand. So they have to analyze the side effects and give you something else to fix because they never understood, because they never asked the plant, how much of you should I take? You know what that would take? A little bit of beingness. Could you picture these people in lab coats up in the mountains of Peru or the Himalayas or wherever or in the desert sitting and doing the shamanic thing? Lean against a plant, go into a meditation until you become the plant. You start to feel its you know, juices moving through it. It becomes your veins. You can't tell the difference anymore. Its skin, a bird lands on it, but it landed on you because I'm not separate from it. So now when I ask the plant, what are you? It's not a separate thing. It's what am I? And it starts downloading. You don't have to actually take peyote to experience peyote. You say, what are you? I am. Anything. The love of Christ consciousness. You don't analyze the teachings of Jesus. He wants you to become this. We have to become this. And stop doing recovery, although that's a good start. You become the recovered one. And then you become the healthy one, right? We get away from the, the early steps of, I don't know, I don't know. Science tells us to memorize things, then you'll understand them. You can memorize two plus two is four, but what does it mean? What, what do you mean? It just, it just, I don't know. I memorized that that's the way it works. How do you know two plus two isn't five? Because I was told that it's this. Do you understand it? Or, you know, what, what if you bring in higher... Forms of math that start telling you one plus one is two, two plus two is four. But eventually, the numbers don't add up anymore because you've entered a different form of geometry. That all of a sudden, you're leaping when you're doing your numbers. Because you didn't know that I wanted to say one plus one is two, two plus two is four. But at some point, I decided to start adding an extra one to any digit. Well, I didn't know you were going to do that. I know. That's the problem here. It's, you, there's no allowing for anything else. It's very linear, very left-brained. And we live in a left-brained world. And one of the saddest things, in my opinion, one of the saddest things I've seen working with people for all these years, people that are labeled messed up, labeled to take medication, they're medicating people because they're not left-brained enough. But you can't medicate them into being left-brained. Well, what we can do is medicate them enough to get them to shut up so that we don't have to deal with them. That's the idea. Why not allow more of a right brain world? Well, no, that's not okay. 
we don't need no edge, you know, the wall. Anyway, <laughs> we don't need no thought control. So if, if we allowed, you know, like t a right brain, now right brain can be hijacked by the ego just like the left brain. The right brain can be too abstract. You know, you don't want to talk to an electrician who wired your house <laughs> and say, is everything wired properly to standards and the codes in the city because they're going to come and inspect it? Well, who knows what's really right? <laughs> I mean, you know, there are wires. <laughs> and they're going somewhere. But do we really need to know where? I mean, seriously, like, and you get this in Sedona, by the way, you know. <laughs> wow, man. I can feel the electric buzzing in the walls, you know. So uh, there's a place, but the left brain needs to be God-guided, and so does the right brain, because everything has to come back to God. People have a George Harrison song, they've forgotten all about God. You know, a line in there. And it's true. And then he says, and he's the only reason we exist. Not only because of God creating us, but to be part of God, to love and thrive in God is our reason for existence. It isn't to get here and retire after a job for 80 years or whatever it is with a watch. I don't know if they still give watches, but whatever, right? <laughs> don't get me a watch when I retire, okay? <laughs> See, I've never had a watch. And, and I am, I am, in, in some ways, I am clearly right-brained. But, but not in the abstract sense. Right brain means concepts. Right brain means we open our mind and God downloads to us concepts. But the left brain has to explain it. And that's the perfect flow. Receive with your right brain, explain with your left brain. Here's a concept, wow. But then, do I just sit here and go, do you all get that? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Thank you for being here. It's Receive and then put it in words, put it into words, and sometimes bullet points. And why? Because it grounds it. That's right to do. Ground it. Make it applicable. Make it understandable. If it's too excessively right brain and nobody understands it, how's that helpful? If it's excessively left brain and we analyze the heck out of it, but nobody can feel it, how is that helpful? You see? So, Science, religion, government. They, they don't want you to have personal experience because it gets you too close to the truth, the, the truth of God. So there's got to be this, this, you know, attempt to, no, no, just keep everything left brain. So the Garden of Eden, one of the stories we get, one of the metaphors and stories and lessons we get from the Garden of Eden, they ate from the tree of knowledge. You know what knowledge is? Our attempt to individuate from God. It means I know what's right. See, that's the inner scientist, theologian, government leader. I know what's right. So we ate from the tree of knowledge, and that's the inner control freak, the inner fearful one, and the judgmental one. So when we say, no, no, I, I'm going to let go of this, there's a part of you, and even some of your friends will tell you, don't let go of that part of you that, that learned to think, 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 because it helped you survive. You can say that, that might be true. Sometimes being a thinker, an overthinker, it did save me from some dangerous things in my life, but it never taught me how to thrive, only to survive. Is that all I want to be? When people say to you, I'm a survivor, just say, oh, I'm sorry. Try that on them. I mean, be careful. But, but think about what it means. It, I'm not downing that you survived something. Thank God you did. But I'm saying, and is that all? Are you ready to move to the thriver? That's different. That one is like, okay, I, I used the thinker, the survivor, the reactor, etc., for a time. The one primal self that taught me to run when I needed to run. But what if I am as God created me? What if I will to be the Christ on earth? What if I am in God, and if God is with me, what could be against me? See, suddenly I'm downloading something else. I'm plugged in the presence of God. When Jesus said, if one day you're going to be dragged into the courts, but don't be afraid, I'll be the one speaking through you. He's talking not about just literal courts. He's talking about life. 
Just learn to ask for the guidance all the time. The Holy Spirit. What would you have me say? What would you have me do? Just learning to be plugged in. And <clears throat> this, the trap of science and government, that's the head. Now, I'm not saying don't, because people will say to you, get out of your head, man, you got to get in your heart. No, you need both. But you don't just need both, like a balance of both. You need both, but you need both to be inspired by God. So inspirations, as I said a moment ago, they come to us, they download from our upper three chakras, the heaven in, you know, within us, download into our hearts where we start, that's the right brain. Ah, oh, I got a download. And the left brain, let's organize that a little bit. It's perfect. It organizes it, receives it in the heart, right brain, organizes it in the solar plexus, left brain, and then you start to feel the excitement of something's happening wonderful, and that's the emotional center, and the root chakra is, and then we make it so. We, we bring it to earth. We, we now apply it. We live it. So there's a, a workshop coming up after, let's say, the, today's service. If there's anybody, I'm be feeling inspiration. This is just a made-up example. I'm feeling an inspiration. We're going to need to move the chairs. Well, I could just go, well, thank you for telling me we need to move the chairs, Lord. Good. And they're still sitting there. So it becomes, we need to move the chairs. Hey, listen, we're going to need to move the chairs. Could I get some volunteers? Then you get the volunteers, bringing it down to the root, all the way to the root chakra. How about you three volunteers do that section? You three do that section. You three, see, organizing. It's beautiful. Some people will think when you start to say three and three that you're a control freak. They don't understand. It didn't come from your head. You're coming from a different place. And it's not easy to live like this because most people don't know how you got there and what you're doing. They're only used to, when somebody speaks, they're a control freak, especially if they have issues with control. So they're not going to get where you got the idea to go, you three do this, you three. It's going to sound, it's so intense. It's going to sound controlling because they don't get it. That's why Jesus told Pharisees, you don't understand what I'm saying because you don't come from this place. And that's exactly right. You can know what feels right for you. You like to give donations and friends say, oh, you shouldn't give your donations to, you know, you need it for a rainy day. Fear. When you say oh, we should do this and we should, you know, with three people on each section of the room, the organization can just come from the head for some people, but they don't know what it's like to come from somewhere else. So God spoke to David and said, we're going to create a holy, like a Camelot, a God-inspired kingdom. And David's like, what? You're kidding. A, a government to a very hard people at the time. We're going to create a government where God's going to be our guide. We tried having the deliverer, Moses, passes away. We passed that on to warrior uh, Joshua. And then it went to what's called judges. So they had like Greek oracle leading the people of Israel. I think that's great. People that were willing to plug in. That was perfect, but it was still a, a group of people that were going to be spiritual and guide the people. When it shifted to David, King David, something else happened, and it became like a, I need to not just channel, I need to become the presence of God, David, which is a lot of pressure, by the way, because everybody's watching, you know, and so I need to be an example as the new and first you know, king. Well, it's Saul, and then he passes it to David. Saul sort of tries it, but clumsy. David embodies it. But all the other kings that follow couldn't do it. Almost none. Because it's challenging. And we, we have a spiritual center. We have electricity, and we have phones, and we have bills, and 3D things. So can we do this? Now, I'm a little bit right brain, clearly. I can be very right brain at times. So for me, the right brain concept is sometimes a little naive, but it's not necessarily wrong. But I come in and say, hey guys, we can do this. And people, oh, no, 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 that's not how it's done. I remember we were part of another group at one time, and, and I was saying, you know, they called to complain that we got along too well. <laughs> they said, you need to have a board that's contentious, and they fight and they work the stuff. And I said, 
No. I'm checking in. N no. No. No matter how I looked at it, I thought, what's wrong with peace? Why can't politicians go right, left, or whatever they call that thing? Why don't we just talk? No, no, you have to talk based on your group, which means you can't talk freely. You have to stay within the parameters of your group, which means you're limited. And there's two or more opposing groups. Why, why does it have to be like that? Why can't, if a person gets divorced, why can't you still communicate and love each other? What, what is going on? What? Because the ego says no. Because if we allow you to find peace in anything, you're getting closer to God. So here's an example. Our whole history is described, but you can't scientifically learn lessons. You only learn facts based on theorems and so on and so on. You just learn facts. So our history books are almost all, 99 plus percent, are factual history. People that study religion are 99 plus percent factual. They, they look at this gospel and this. I refuse to memorize chapter and verse. I don't even think I could because I got a little too much of the right brain, so it doesn't do that very much. You know, chapter and verse. How many times do you hear me? Samuel 15, 1, you know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I couldn't do it with a straight face um, because it's conceptual. I don't have to tell you what chapter and verse. I can say this thing happened to Jesus and all that matters is what we got from that, not what chapter and verse. If I tell you chapter and verse, and some people do this, and then everybody's in the audience, flipping to the chapter and verse, by the time they find it, we're done explaining the lesson and we move on. That's a weird way to be. Why don't we just trust that when I'm saying this happened to Jesus and you either get it or you'd like it or you don't. If you don't, you go, okay, move on to the next topic, Michael. And if you like it, you're like, whoa, something happened. Where did it, ha it happen between you and God? You know, so we're talking about activations, not memorizations. <laughs> so our history is, is, is not about science. Listen to the weatherman. He's not even right half of the time. But do you know what? He's paid to be a weatherman. But if you're a psychic and you're only right half the time, you're ridiculed. Most good psychics are right 80 plus percent of the time. Why aren't you paid what the weatherman's paid? Why doesn't the government say, and on to the next news, our psychic's going to report? And they step up and they give you an 80% accurate report and then the weatherman standing over there, bastard. You know, just, how dare you? You know, last week I told them it was going to snow, and you're like, well, my guides are saying no, and it didn't, and now you're mad at the, the psychic. Why can't we go? Because it's too scary. It's too close to God for us to know that it wasn't going to snow when the weatherman said it was. And if you're a weatherman, don't take any offense, okay? <laughs> the same is true for those kinds of things. The doctor that says you will not live, and then miraculously you lived. Why isn't there more on that topic? That, why did somebody survive? Well, they had a group of people pray over them. That's not scientific enough. Well, then we must change sciences. Let's change our alliances. If that doesn't work, I mean, think about this. Not a lot's changing about what Jesus taught, love and forgiveness. Go to science books, and any science book you read is already outdated. They keep changing the story. Why would you trust something that keeps changing? It doesn't make sense. Changing meaning inaccurate. The book published today on science, I don't care if it's a science of biology or astronomy, anything. Whatever science is published, medicine included, by the time you read it, the people writing the books are already well aware that it's not accurate. Do you know that? Usually 10 and 20 years difference. By the time they've written it, and it reaches you, it's already 10 to 20 years old and inaccurate. They're already working on what's going to be studied 20 years from now. Now, that's cool in its own right, I guess. But that's not the God I would follow. The one that, well, for today, this is God, but it won't be there tomorrow. It'll be different. We're always growing. I get that. But this is a thing that claims to be factual, 
that never lands and shows itself to be solid. God is changeless in that it is always love. Peace, joy, oneness. It's not like, well, we thought God was love, but it's not. Turns out it's semi-love. It, it, it just is what it is. So, <laughs> when you go into this, people get very desperate. We told you, we decided, we analyzed you or your blood, and we decided you're ill. We decided this. We also decided what kind of medication will not cure you, usually. It'll just mask the symptoms. But those things that will mask the symptoms are going to probably cause you all kinds of horrendous side effects. <laughs> but we have something for that. That is your religion. The thing you put faith in is what I mean by religion. It's kind of strange. So here's, here's an example. In opposite to the, all the left brain stuff is called mythology. If you could study mythology along with history, you would see that they go like this. When science is going, well, we believe there was a Big Bang, blah, 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 and they go into all that, oh, yeah, that's described in Greek mythology and Sumerian mythology and African mythology. You know, what do you mean? See, they don't want you to say that because it'll sort of negate their existence, that they need to wait until they figure out that factually that that's what happened. Well, I don't need that. In the beginning, you know, there's... What is this thing that they think was nothingness and then exploded into... Well, just it was a coincidental fusion of chemicals and then it exploded and became the universe. And somehow you crawled out of that and you're sitting here today. <laughs> but, but go to the mythology that was there long before the science. Hundreds of thousands of years before the science, seriously. And they said, well, we can tell you what happened. There's this stillness the void. And the void is the moment that the children of God who were one with God with their eye wide open, one with God, all of a sudden went, what if we were not one with God? And we closed our eyes. Now I can't see anything. That's called the void. When I no longer am seeing as God, I closed my eyes and started imagining something else. When we started imagining, we started creating it. Boom! And there's chaos you know, the chaos is my fear of what I've just done. There is chaos. It's being manifested as chemicals. And you could say, what a beautiful sight that would have been. No, it would have been horrible. If you could remember what it feels like, if you were floating in the darkness of the void and you could see and hear and feel the explosion, it would destroy you. Because underneath the, this, the, this explosion of, and, and the thing we call chaos is the feeling of having separated from love. And that doesn't feel good at all. That's why it was called violent. Does that sound like an attractive word? I would have loved to have been there to experience the violence. Nobody would, in their right mind would say that. But that's what we did. The violence outside became the violence we felt inside. The violence inside was how much we were judging ourselves for leaving love. And everything comes from that. So in mythology, here's an example. In, in Egyptian mythology, because I say Greek a lot, so it's all these cultures. Egyptian mythology, you have Osiris, who's like God the father. You have Isis, who's like God the mother aspect of God. And then you have Horus, who's like Horus. It almost sounds like Christ. Horus. And Osiris is the father and Isis the mother. Osiris has a brother called Set, which is Satan. Long before there's a Satan, by our naming, mythology already had a name in various forms, whether it's Loki or Set. But we have this thing. Osiris and Isis, the mother and father God, and their son Horus. Now what's interesting is, at some point, Set, evil, science, or whatever thing you want to call it, that which is non-believing in the power and knowing of, of Osiris, you know what it does? It puts Osiris in this box and kills him. Bummer, okay. Then Isis comes along and revives him. That's beautiful. Nice, nice job. Thank you, Isis. But then evil comes along and says, well, we can't have him revived again. So they chop Osiris up into pieces and send them to all kinds of regions to separate him so that he can't be revived. And Isis didn't give up. She went and found all the parts of Osiris, gathered them back together. She found them all except one part, his penis. 
which I'll get to in a minute <laughs> as to why that is. I mean, it could have just been for fun, you know, just a funny, hey, let's tell the story where they can't find his penis. So men are always looking for, anyway. Um, so what does the story actually tell us? You step back and go, the evil tried to put Osiris in a box to kill it. You see, when you put God in a box, you're trying to kill God. You're trying to make God into what you think it is. That's already killing it because it's not expansive truth. It's just your opinion. Okay, that's already bad enough. But Osiris, she's the divine mother. She's the one that says, those are my children. I will not allow them to be disconnected from God. So she revives, no, God is still here. Well, it isn't because it was a box and I tried that religion and it didn't work. That's not God. So she says, God's here, great. The world, again, chops it all up, as I said throws it in different, what's that? It's called religions, sciences, opinions. See, that's taking the one truth of God and shattering it into an inconceivable number of parts. Why? Because now I don't know which one, which religion, which teacher, which book. See, so that you get exhausted and feel hopeless. Nice job. And who did that? That's what evil will do. Try to put a veil, evil, evil, a veil between you and God. And if one veil isn't enough, let's create an inconceivable number, myriad number of veils that just perpetuate and they multiply themselves. So I don't know where to look anymore. So she gathers all the parts to bring God back together. Now, that could be seen as a, a teacher that is a great teacher and shows you how the different beliefs and philosophies, how they come together, which we do a lot of here. But why the symbolism of the castration, we'll call it? Because it's a symbol of even when you try to bring all these pieces together, this is the world's trying to say there's no potency. Potency, right? The generative force. We cut that part off. It's not to say that part's bad. It's to say it's a symbol of now these little religions, even if you try to tie them together, it's, it's missing something. What is it? It's potency. So we can't just eclectically bring people philosophically together. This is this center where we talk about Hinduism. and you know, There are churches like that. We are all inclusive. We, you know, and to prove it, we have statues of this or that. Ask the employees, who's that statue? Well, I don't know, but we're all inclusive. No, you're not. I can tell you anything about anything we do here, why we do it. I can tell you why the flowers hanging from the ceiling. Because I like them. <laughs> they represent life, color. I know why we did We didn't just do it to decorate. Why do I have an earth, wind, and fire poster in our foyer? Because it's life, it's love. If you've ever seen them, especially in the old days, their concerts, the color, the Africana's outfits and robes, and it was so filled with life. We didn't just go, well, let's put that. Nothing, the archangels, the statuary, see? It's not gratuitous. So even when you try to eclectically prove, and some of you have you know, brought me stories of, you know, I met a guy, I think he's the right one, really cool. Yeah, he studies all kinds, he's open, he studies this, he, he can quote the Upanishads and the Vedas and Lao Tzu and so on. But it doesn't take long for me to see that that's all he can do, is quote it. There's no embodying, you know? And that's the potency part. So we can't just eclectically bring things into this center, and you should not just eclectically show how open-minded by studying many things. There's one piece missing, potency, where it gets activated. How is it going to get activated? The Holy Spirit. We've got to bring God back into the picture, not just studying, because then you're just doing a, a more philosophical version of science and religion. Studying things, yes, more open-minded. You're studying things that are a little more lofty. I think that's great. It's a step towards home. But do you stop there or do you allow something else? A baptism of the Holy Spirit. Stop talking about and start to become. But the world is actively involved in sabotaging our attempts to reconnect with God. Think about that. 
Is that mythology making sense? Chop it up. Divide it. Analyze the pieces. And as soon as you say there are pieces to analyze, you're fragmenting, and God is not about fragmentation. So I have to sit back and breathe and look at this. Even if you favor, it's not you're wrong, if you favor Catholicism or Hindu, you know, or paganism, whatever, if, if you favor something, doesn't make you wrong. That's just your preferred thing. Honor them all. Honor the light in them all. Honor the love in them all. And then you're really starting to understand what Zarathustra taught, which is, in everything is everything. In every atom is every, all life is in every atom. Every cell contains everything, which is now called you know, uh, um, sacred geometry, you know, when you start getting into fractals, you start looking at things like uh, uh, certain approaches to biology. People are starting to understand, like Edgar Cayce told them a hundred years ago, the day will come when you'll be able to see all the health issues and, and vitalities of the body through a spot of blood. Because in everything is everything. Now, what, so when we start to realize, oh my God, there's so much you know what? And what are you drawn to? And any one of those can still take you home. It's a doorway. It isn't the thing you're going to. It's just a way. That's why Jesus would say, I am the way. He's describing the way home. Bubble gum can be a way, but is it as potent? It's got to have the potency. The teachers, that the watered down. I'm glad that you study a watered down teacher. I'm glad you like watered down books. But the time comes when we say, I'm ready to go to another level. See, there are books that people read, and you can say, oh, this is my favorite book, and you show me. And it'll take me like eight chapters to finally go, oh, that's a good line. And that's watered down. All of us are getting to the place where, see, the world is getting, when they say to you, everybody wants quick learning, right? Everybody wants, you know, they want videos that are five minutes instead of 50, right? Part of the good behind that is it's a statement people are saying, I want now. I don't want to study for hours or years anymore. I want answers now. Now, the downside to that is it's very tangential. I want this, I want this, and they jump around. That's the downside. But underneath it, what do I see really happening is people are fed up with being talked to for hours and getting nowhere, for practicing a religion for all their life, only for it to not bring them home. You have to have the potency, and Isis understood that. Osiris understood that. Horus is that Christ figure, their son, understood that. We have to find what works and work it, like even Buddha had said. Don't do something just because I said so. Try it out. If it works for you, use it. If it doesn't, let it go. That's a responsible way of life, a responsible, a person that's being very responsible on their spiritual path. Whether that's counseling, don't go to counselors, j just chat. You know, that was okay 40 years ago and 20 years ago. 40 years ago, it was, you know, they were chatting, but they were analyzing you because that's what they were taught to do. Then 20 years ago, it became fashionable. You became girlfriends, you know. We chat, you know, and hi, and how have you been? Oh, oh I'm dating a new guy. Oh, and it's just chatting, but you're, it's warmer, you know, or whatever male and female issues are going on. It's warmer, but still God wasn't allowed to be brought more blatantly into counseling sessions. And at the end of the day, none of this will work if you don't bring God into the picture. You will not get answers. Government, just like science, is going to, just like medicine, is going to keep having theories that they will apply, that will not work, that they have to now react to to fix the last thing they did. That's not the way of God. God is seek and ye shall find. Why doesn't medicine make that their first statement? Seek and find. You seek for health, we will find that. We will sit with you and work with you on that. Right? Why isn't religion? You're seeking God? By all means, we're going to sit here, we're going to talk it, work it, and if you don't have a personal experience with spirit, if you don't feel more uplifted, more happy, more joyous, more forgiving, within a year, please go somewhere else. Right? No, no, no. It's our flock. You know, and everybody's looked at as ka -ching. You know, 
We're one family and just everything's about the money and the multiplying the numbers, getting a bigger b building and hating people that have the bigger building than you. Back to the castration. So, <laughs> well, it is. It's the same, it's the same ridiculous game. You know, trying to be bigger, bad, or, you know, the impressive. There are people that don't like some of the uh, uh, evangelists because they have more people attending. And they shame them on, uh, publicly on videos and, and they'll say they're of the devil. Why? Just because a bigger building? Just because more people? Really? Why don't we look at that? I remember a, a, a guy, um, he was a Course in Miracles teacher, and he had me go and speak to his group. And when we did, he usually had at his group maybe 40 people. When he would have me speak, we'd have a hundred and something people flocking to just fill the room. And I would do this a couple times a year, once a year, or whatever, for several years, or a few years to start with. And it was wonderful. And people were like, oh man, we, we, when are you going to get Michael back? It was great. At some point, I wasn't invited back for a year or two. <laughs> and, you know, it was interesting because this guy, he, after I would do the talk, he wanted to go out and he would uh, want to sit and chat, you know, and thank me for being there and get me some cheesecake. Well, he did. He would always get me some cheesecake. So we would sit and, you know, then eat cheesecake while he's having whatever. And, you know, he said, I want to tell you something. I didn't invite you here for a couple of years, and it's because I was jealous. That's what he said. He said, I, I was like teaching the course for years. I'm the one who has this group. I organize this thing. I've been putting every week into it. I do this group. And you show up and there's three times the people. And I was like, well, why don't they love me like they love him? Now, I've never forgotten that. Such vulnerable honesty, right? I mean, that guy gets A Course in Miracles. The ones that preach it that won't own such things, they're still not getting it. So I really loved that. And, and I always included him. I didn't say, well, look, look at how cool am I. I get a lot more people than you. I would sit there and go, and that's why he's telling you each week. I would include him in the things I'm saying so that he's part of this success. You see? And that's what we can do. We can learn to bridge with each other. We can learn to include. The, the Republican can include. I really love the way that Democratic guy did that. But they won't usually. A bit more bridging, you know, in all walks of life. Mom, validate dad. Dad, validate mom. Parents, validate the kids. You know, bridge a bit more. The concept of chopping up and separating, whether it's in science, religion, or whatever other faction of life, facet of life, is actually, it's an evil. Because it's something in us that enables us to not get home. It di disables our ability. It enables the, the dragging this out. So think about this. The, the, the story of Osiris, you know? Where have I, in your own life, where have I overanalyzed my finances to the point I don't even understand what we're talking about anymore? Or your relationship. You know, I was feeling like it's very clear to me. Here comes inspiration. This is done. But then everybody talks me into, and that's when the mind kicks in. The tree of knowledge. Well, you can't because, you know, and, and you guys own businesses together, so you can't. And then, you know, and the kids and all these reasons. So that means I knew and I forgot. So I relived the Garden of Eden all over again, just in my not sticking to what I knew to be true, which isn't always easy because sometimes you get these tangential thoughts and you go, well, that, that's my truth. My truth is to move to Sedona and you follow that, but then you run into hardship here in some way and you blame God. I, I get that. It isn't always easy to follow spirit and know exactly what's right. And God knows that. Please know as I'm wrapping up here, God knows that that's a challenge for us. God knows it's not easy for us to just go, bada bing, you know, inspiration, go, done. Because then you wouldn't be here. It's the little challenges and lessons that kind of draw us to the earth so that when, you know, inspiration comes through, it sort of runs into these parts of us, which are unwindings, potential unwindings, where the fear gets looked at. The inhibitions get looked at. Shyness gets looked at. Competition gets looked at. That stuff we think is the world messing with us and hurting us, but it's, it is us. So we see, here's the flow, and where there's not the flow, 
there's parts of me that are in the way. Just like energy flowing through the body and you have a muscle that's tense and it's impinging on that nerve or impinging on that meridian. We'll get that to unwind and open up and that's how we learn to live. Where I'm not chopped up into pieces anymore. We learn, there's inspiration. We don't, I'm not talking about rash inspirations. I'm talking about real ones, which are always love-based. They're clear, they're insightful, they're inclusive. There's ways to know what's inspiration and what's just garbage that's, you know, just messing with you. Loving, inclusive, win-win scenarios. And if we set our lives, to set our course and demand that, insist on that, I don't want to hear all this other stuff. This is where I'm going. What is the easiest thing for this conversation? Yeah, but if I say this, then they'll say this and they'll counter with that. And if I do that, that's going to make them right. And if they're right now, they're going to think they're right in all our arguments. That's what we do. And that's set chopping up the relationship and scattering it to all parts of the world. There's another way. Your will of clarity, not mine of chaos. And you sit, learn to sit and you start the day and you set that as your tone. You get used to that. This is the kind of day I want. This is the life I want. Clarity. And just even a little intention in that direction, all of a sudden, something just, bing, comes to us. Have I told you lately how much I appreciate you to that person that you were doing this? Well, no, actually. But it means a lot to me that you said that. You're already changing the dynamic of the moment. They feel seen. They feel heard. They feel appreciated. See, and I'm not making it up. I do appreciate you, so you say it. That, that we think, takes effort, and it takes a really big person to be the one. I'm not talking about compromising and, and being made wrong. I'm talking about expanding, not compromising, expanding to include the other person. And then spirit can come through, and it just moves through. And to me... Whether you're a person that does inventions or writes music, this is the highest place. When you get your consciousness together, the higher music, higher poems, higher friendships, everything starts to exponentially improve because you've chosen to get into that right place. There is no castration. There is no cutting off of the potency. So we don't just talk about techniques for fixing relationships. It has potency behind it. So keep that in mind as you go into your life. Foods should have life-generating qualities, potency. Friendships should have zeal. They should make you excited to see each other. Not, oh. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make sense. When you have to go get a massage before you go home to see your partner because you need the tension in your shoulders worked out because just thinking about them makes you, you know, something's wrong. God wants our peace. Analyzing things never bring peace. They do not. It brings chaos. It brings more conflict, conflict, confusion. The way of God, peace. The way of God, friendship. The way of God, inspiration. And I am the way of God. Allowing myself to experience good things is one of, if there's a shortcut home, the shortcut home. Loving myself enough to allow peace into my life instead of analysis, over-analysis, conflict, self-doubt. Why? That's not God. So when I allow peaceful solutions, win-win scenarios, and that becomes my way of life, everything starts to change because I'm living the way of Christ consciousness. Please take a few centering breaths. As usual, just the decompression, you know, just, wow. Allow anything you heard that makes sense to soak in. Anything that was confusing or disturbing, just let it go. Focus on what made sense, because that improves upon your self-awareness, your self-worth. The 
The ways of the world are not ways at all. They lead nowhere. The ways of the world are mazes that aren't very amazing. So the ways are not helpful ultimately, but the way is. The way as a tool is known as forgiveness, love, patience. But the way by name is the Christ. I am the way. He wasn't talking about his personality, Jesus, the person. He wasn't talking about his gender, his race. I am is how he starts it. I am is the way. I am is the truth. I am is the life. I am is the light. I am is God. I am that I am. I am as God created me. One of you had asked about freedom from thought and thinking. This is exactly right. Try to allow something to come to mind. Uh, a challenge you've had recently where you're clear that your head came in and created some deduction and theory around it, some fix its. See if you can come up with one. A recent challenge where your head, your thinking, your thought processes were used to solve the issue. The more thought, thinking, efforting, the better. Human reason and deduction. Allow that as much as possible. And let's then try something else. Hear that wonderful mantra just once. Change what you can and accept what you can't. And try that for a moment. The effort, the thinking, what I was going to do to fix headaches and what I was going to advise somebody else who was struggling and stop. I changed what I could. Even if it's trying to fix something or heal something. And I will now step back and accept what I can it's not a failure. It's like saying, and on the seventh day, God rested. So step back out of it. Still aware of what the challenge was and what the repair was, but there's an acceptance that's new. I'm not forcing it. I'm not pushing it. I'm sitting back, relaxing for just a moment. And I'll add, God, how would you have had me see this differently? What would you have me see it as now? And just give it one minute to see if your emotions, tensions around it ease a little and possibly insights get added, newer, grander insights as to what you might do. It's called inspiration. You may or may not get that. It doesn't matter. What you want most is to allow a shift in your feelings. But if it's accompanied with new ideas on how to handle that, nice job. Give that a moment. And if you received any insights, it could be spontaneous ideas, 
close with asking how you're going to implement those ideas. Get some tangible, okay, what do I do next? thanks, Father, Mother, God, that this tool, technique, idea is available to us always. We can try to do things our way, but the our way is from the ego, from fear, from reaction, limitation. This is not how I choose to live. Show me the way, your way, Yahweh. I give thanks that this is actually the way you've always wanted my life to be. I'm not asking for anything special or having to work and deserve it. It's already here. Oh, I forgive my silliness. I can now receive on any topic, any level, when I get quiet and listen, surrendering my will and allowing yours. And so it is. Good. Just take a moment to integrate, center. We will do our closing prayer in just a moment. How are you all feeling? Hmm? Good. What did you learn or hear today that made the most sense? Yes. Good. Integration, yeah. Inspiration and then integration, but the potency to get it to go, to move. Right. Anyone else? Yes? I was thinking about the difference between gnosis and knowledge and like imagining the world if we all followed that gnosis. Right. And that uh, divine inspiration. Knowing versus knowledge. The knowing is, you know, now again, I'm not, there's not competing. Like I said, things can get so easily tricked into that. You can have spiritual centers competing in their strange ways. You know, whoever has the bigger church, it's just Freudian joke, you know, come on. Whoever has the most, when when people talk on, on, you know, programs, And they talk about religions. You know, one of the things they often say, how many followers? Who cares? Tell me how much it's changed people's lives. That's that's the first thing that it should say. Changed people's lives. So there are programs where people say, I died and saw things and came back. They're more changed than religions. Why? Because it was experiential. So why don't we make them into a religion? That'd be kind of cool. They're NDE. Religion, you know, that, you know, because it's real. They believe whether they liked what they saw or didn't. They know there's more. That's kind of cool. So the knowledge versus knowing, I get it. I've had my near-death experience. You see that kind of the knowingness. You tell somebody who went to the other side, they could even have been scientists, academics, whatever, atheists. They usually don't say, yeah, when I got to the other side, I saw all this bliss and uh, beings, and it's just an illusion. It's, it's not real. Some of them will because they're talk, talked into it. Oh, that was just neur- neurons firing and that whole tunnel and angels. Out. No, you know, you thought you saw angels. It was just a neuron exploding. It wasn't wings. It was neurons exploding. That's what, and some people will buy into that. But the majority, my life will never be the same. That's amazing. But I'm going to say to you, once we talk about religion again, why do you have to have a near-death experience to make that decision? Don't you just know? See? And yes, we can. Anyone else? Okay. We're going to take up our collection. If you take a moment. 
be as generous as you can be, please. <clears throat> and hold your love offering to your heart. Your donations go in the bags, preferably, but any extra donations would go in the wicker baskets. That's extra donations towards um, special projects or people of lesser means that we help out and so on, okay? Holding that in mind, your prayer is on line posted, but it's also on your bulletins here together. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive, and so it is. Thank you. I'm going to share a few announcements, but again... Um, how did you do with even understanding the mythology and the attempt to, to segment and make into fractions the truth of God? Is that making sense? And isn't it interesting that to see that ancient people already knew this? People that we think are kind of, oh, those religious, superstitious kind of primitives from the past. Yet they knew. Isn't that interesting? How easy it is to forget the, the obvious. So mythology allows the right brain to bring in concepts, and the concepts can include how we got here, where we are, and where we're going. The left brain has no idea, no idea at all on how to do that. So a couple of quick announcements. Um, for starters, um, thank you for watching the program in person and, uh, and online. Bless you for being with us. And thank you so much for your support. It's, it's very moving and very powerful to have people post on YouTube and Facebook and so on when they say, I mean, this is interesting, but like someone will say, I was near death or self-destruction. I was feeling so hopeless. And it isn't always dark stories, but it's amazing when they say, and, and coincidentally, I saw the name of the program and I watched it and it's changed everything. I mean... Think about this. Any of you on this program watching, any of us on this planet, to have changed even one fragment of someone's life, how amazing that is. But why, why don't we just make that more of our way of life? Not forcing, not preaching it, but to make a difference everywhere we can. You just don't. It's like that It's a Wonderful Life movie. You have no idea the good that your goodness brings. We so underestimate that. It even sounds arrogant to imagine that we save lives. It's not arrogant. It's right. And we should be changing, changing and saving lives. I don't care if it's a, an animal on the side of the road or a person. To, to make a difference. Get a person to smile or to feel loved. Right? You know, get an animal to, to, to trust again instead of its program of abuse. I mean, what a difference we can all make. How's everyone feeling? Good. A little clearer, right? Anything at all you got that you can bring to the world from today? Nice. Bring, if nothing else, a smile. Even just helping people feel seen, valued, not stroking their ego. I'm talking about their soul. Valued and even these words, which some people don't like, give them a sense of hope. Some people are so here, down here, that even hope is the word we have to use. Some of you think that's a small word. Oh, no, no, hope means there's a chance, no hope. Hey, you know what? That's where some of us are. Anyone going through the dark night of the soul knows to feel an ounce of hope is like everything, from starvation to, you know, sustenance, fullness. It's wonderful. Please stand for our closing prayer. Hmm. Right on. Just tuning in for a moment. Did you get something from today? Yes, yes, yes. Get that feeling. The feeling. Yes, clearly. Wow. Wow, these people. Wow, this is a trip. These people. You know, you could be visiting and just, you know, this could be your first love-in, you know? <laughs> like, wow, what's this about? All these huggers, you know? And whatever it is. Just soak it in for a moment. Wow. Smiling faces. And if you're not in the smiling hugger and you're in a dark night and you're like broken... We still see you. We're not leaving you out. We still see you. Absolutely sending and downloading 
all the love you need to get you through and get inspirations to get you through the dark night of the soul. Agreed, guys? We're all there, right? Look around at each other with a smile, a hand on heart, and just look and just either say it or hear it in your mind. Peace be with you. The peace of God be with you. The peace of God would be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. Hmm. The light of God surrounds us. We are the, light of God. the love of God enfolds us. We are the, love of God. the power of God.